Hello, everybody. Michael Lombardo here. This is Awaken Live. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm going to go on my Facebook really fast, like you all know who have been watching this, and I am going to take off the privacy setting really fast and make it public so you guys could go ahead and share this. So now it's public, so anyone who wants to share it, you can share it now. I'm going to put this at the bottom, Awaken Live. I am really excited about this show because of my guest, of course. I'm always excited about the people that I have on the show. But also, at the same time, I realized I went through all of my Awaken Live videos, and I realized that this one is going to be the 50th episode, the 50th episode of Awaken Live. Thank you, Rebecca, for joining. Um, so all you guys that are watching and that are tuning in, feel free to say hi, comment at the bottom share this, tell us where you're watching from, likes, hearts, all that good stuff. Thank you, Heather, for tuning in. Hooray, number 50. Yeah, so it started. My first Awaken Live video actually was April 25th of 2017. I had my friend Gareth Cunningham on the show with me, and um, we spoke about Fan the Flame Conference, an Irish Global Conference that was taking place last year. And anyway, the Lord spoke to me about doing these interview style shows via Facebook Live, and I really just started based on a word that was dropped into my spirit. It wasn't a really loud word. It wasn't like anything wild. It was just an idea in my spirit, really before people were really, really utilizing Facebook Live in this in, in this interview format. I saw only one or two people doing it, and it wasn't even regularly, but it dropped in my heart to do it, and I heard the Holy Spirit say, stop thinking about it and just do it. And I was like, all right, so I just started having close friends, missionaries, you know, um, people that I know and love that are anointed, that carry a now word for the body of Christ, friends of mine that needed funding for their missions trips that I believed in sincerely. I had them on to help spread the word about their mission trips, help get funding for them. Thank you, everyone who's watching. Feel free to like this. Feel free to say hi. Let me know where you're watching from. I'm just talking about um, right now, for those who just tuned in, I'm just talking about how this is the 50th episode of Awaken Live. So I just started doing it by faith. And then God began connecting me with chosen books and then getting involved with Destiny Image Publishers with my book, Immersed in His Glory, which is actually right here, Immersed in His Glory. So anyway, I got introduced to Destiny and Chosen. They started sending me their authors. Really cool God connections started to take place. And I get messages all the time of people getting healed through the broadcast or people getting saved or really super encouraged or a prophetic word that was right on and accurate for somebody who was watching the show. And there's just been momentum on it. God's been breathing on it. I really had no clue where this was going to go. And I still feel like this is just the beginning, that God's got so much more for this. But I just want to thank you guys, you know, those who are watching now and maybe later, those who have been watching Awaken Live, you've been engaging with the posts, you've been sharing the posts, you've been, you know, you've been a part of this online community. And I, I just want to thank you. I'm grateful for you. Selena is grateful for you. We love you guys so much. And because you've been affected and blessed by it, you've been helping get this to more people to be blessed and touched by it as well. So I'm grateful. We love you guys so much. This is the 50th episode of Awaken Live, and it's going to continue in God's hand, whatever he wants to do, however he wants to do it. But a conviction of mine really is that it's spirit led, that it's not there's not so much form and function but that we let the Holy Spirit have his way and that people get ministered to as they come on because people are coming up, coming in on this show with all kinds of issues, ailments, hurts, pains, need inspiration, need encouragement. Thank you for joining in. Hi from Africa, Mozambique. How you doing? See, that's so cool. People are watching right now from Africa. Like that's the kind of influence that God, you know, with social media and everything, we could reach people all over the world, literally discipling the nations from your living room. So Thank you guys so much for watching, and I am excited to have my guest on the show today. I was connected to him through Sam Juan, and I'm you know they have Pursuit NYC in New York City, and I had Sam on the show. Really, it was early on in the show. I think it was August or September of 2017. We spoke about persevering in the promise, and I got to know him a lot. We built a friendship, and Sam is incredible. He is pioneering an amazing work in New York City, really just stewarding revival and really being patient and consistent, and they're seeing beautiful and amazing things take place. So Sam Juan connected me with Will Chung, who is over in California, and let me read to you a little bit about Will before I get him on the show. Um, so let me see right here. I got his, I got his bio. I just started to get to know this man of God and we really have a kindred spirit. You know, our hearts are very much alike. So I know you guys are going to enjoy him and really 
be ministered to by him today. But he is on the leadership team for the Meeting Place TMP, which is a prayer gathering and training center for people who are looking to go deeper in their faith and calling, which is in California. He is passionate about souls, training leaders, global missions, and mobilizing God's people for kingdom work. By the grace of God, he travels around the world preaching the gospel, challenging people to live radical lives for Christ. So no further ado, I'm going to get him on the program right now. Hey, Will. How you doing, brother? Thanks for joining me. What's up, man? What's going on, bro? <laughs> I'm really happy that you're on the show. Thanks for taking the time, man. No, man. It's an honor and joy. Are you able to see comments at the bottom by any chance? Because Sam just said something. Yeah, yeah, you know what? You know what? I, can't. I can't. I okay. can only I see, see you and you myself. myself. Okay, all right, all right. Well, I'll let you know if somebody comments at the bottom that 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 uh, that shouts you out. But Sam Juan said, "Oh, thanks, bro. I'm excited for today's show. He's watching." Right now. <laughs> <laughs> he texted me. He texted me earlier today and said, "Bro, I'm tuning in live." I said, "For sure." Yeah. Bro. Better tune in live, but Sam, it's so good to um, thank you so much for connecting me with Will. But anyway, we, me and you connected over the phone not too long ago, and you and you told me about your heart kind of your testimony a bit and what you're doing now. But for those who are watching the show that maybe they're not familiar with you and your ministry, tell us um, a bit of your testimony and kind of how you got to where you are today. Maybe some stuff you're doing today. Sure. Um, uh, yeah, well, I was actually born and raised in Korea until I was 15, but I grew up in the U.S. Army base there in Yongsan, which is why I speak English. Everyone always asks me, how do you speak English so well? But I grew up on the military base and I actually, um, I didn't grow up in church. I actually ran away when I was 15 because we were in the middle of a drug investigation because I used to sell drugs as a high school kid, primarily marijuana because the law in Korea is very different. So I actually got banned from returning back to Korea. And when I moved to Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, um, at a small local church my junior year in high school, I was forced to go to a service. Uh, my mom just, she just, she forced me to go to church that night. And as a guest speaker, crazy thing is the guest speaker is now my father-in-law. That's a long story, but he was, I had a guest speaker, an evangelist and a missionary that came and I had a radical encounter with Jesus. I got saved. I was, I was broken under the conviction of my sins, but also set free by his love. And then two years later, I became a youth pastor. Um, I always tell people I got tricked into ministry. I was just asked to preach, and I preached. And the next thing you know, I was being interviewed for a position in California. At that time, I was still living in Illinois. Um, But I moved over my sophomore year. I transferred to Biola University from Trinity in Deerfield, Illinois. Became a youth pastor for eight years, a youth and college ministry. Uh, And then I also helped my father-in-law at the time. And he's still my spiritual father and my mentor, but he's a missionary So for 10 years, I um, served with him on the mission field all over Latin America and even Southeast Asia. And now, 2017 of April, my wife and I, we got this vision to start this prayer gathering, to gather the hungry and broken, to meet with God, and to raise up spiritual leaders to make a kingdom impact. And we started it in our living room exactly a year ago now, um, a year ago in this apartment right here in my, over here in OC or LA County. And, um... We started with 28 people that were hungry for God, and God's just been blessing it. And it's a monthly prayer gathering and a monthly leaders and pastors training. And yeah, man, God's just been really doing some new and exciting things through our times together. Mm. Yeah. yeah, man, that's really that's really awesome stuff. And I know I, one thing I love about your testimony, and this is something that we're talking about today. I'm going to put this at the bottom, kind of like the topic right here, building in the spirit. All right, boom. I'm going to put it there at the bottom. But one thing I love about your testimony, man, is that you were serving as a pastor for eight years. Okay, so you 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 look like a young guy. How old are you? I'm 28. You're 28. Okay, and I'm 30. Yeah. So we're so we're both young guys. But, you know, and this is something that we spoke about on the phone, and this is um, a little bit of where we're going today. But you served eight years as a pastor, right, as a, as a community pastor, a uh, youth pastor. And then you also served your father-in-law. Okay, so you're serving and you're being faithful and God's grooming you. And this is something that I really believe, you know, this generation needs. And this is something that's on your heart as well. Like I served for years under spiritual leaders and God imparted into me, broke stuff off of me. You know, integrity, character needs to be formed. But, you know, nowadays, you know, so many people just want to launch out into ministry, start their own ministry. They want 
everything now, you know, serving is something, you know, it's a nice message, but not something we actually want to do. And I know this is a huge passion of yours, man. You've lived it. You've lived it in a major way. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, for me, dude, I never thought I would be doing anything but serving the Lord. And I had no desire to it wasn't even a desire to do ministry as much as it was just to serve God and his people. And the Bible is clear, you're faithful with few, you be faithful with much, um, and God rewards faithfulness. I think our generation thinks God rewards giftedness, but God actually rewards faithfulness. And all throughout scriptures, the parable, the talents, you're faithful with one, or you're faithful with two, and then it goes to four, and then it goes to eight, then it goes to 16. And God is looking for faithful people. And I think as long as we are faithful, and by faithfulness, I mean being faithful now, not to your future, because a lot of people are faithful in their mind, and they're faithful to what's to come, but they miss what is already here. And I think God's called us to be stewards for here and now. And if you're faithful today, God will reward you um, and bless you to be, to have more, I don't even like to say more influence, because that could also sound like we're trying to make it big. Yeah. But God just rewards you, and God trusts you, because God is looking for men of character more than he is of, of people who are anointed. Because I think if you're more anointed than you are godly, yeah. Uh, then you become like Saul, then you become like Samson, then you become like Judas. But God is looking for men of God like David and Joseph and, and other people who would just serve him in, in, in the quiet, serve him where they're at. Yeah, yeah. You know. Well, yo, thank you, Sean Tabbitt, for tuning in. It's always awesome to connect with you. I'm going to see you in April, but congrats on episode 50. Thank you so much. Men of character, that's a good word. That's what we said at the bottom, but... Thank you guys for tuning in. You can feel free to share this. Say hi. Thank you, Heather, for for shouting out. But when you said that, man, you're talking about, you know, God, you know, he uh, rewards, you know, we, we think he rewards the anointed or the gifted, you know, but he, he rewards the faithful and brings increase to the faithful. And, you know, over the years, I've thought about the scripture in Proverbs where it says, you know, our giftings will make a way for us. And, you know, a lot of the times, you know, there'll be, there'll be an anointing on somebody's life or there's a strong gifting and that gifting will open doors, you know, tons of doors will swing open. You know, and then we just think that because a door opened, that must be a God door. But just because a door opens doesn't mean it's automatically a God door. You know what I mean? Yeah, that, that, that's yeah. something I've noticed in my life. A bunch of doors will swing open, but the Lord will tell me, don't go down all of those doors. Go down this one singular door. And, you know, I think a lot of times we'll get that confused. We'll think oh, all these doors are swinging open. This has to be God. And then people wind up getting involved with too much. They bite off more than they can chew. And they mm-hmm. and their anointing is driving them. And the anointing is strengthening them because they're involved in ministry. And there's hungry people. And God's going to flow through you. Our giftings are literally a grace gift from God. We don't earn them. They're, they're, you know, the, the, the gifts and talents are ours in Christ, free of charge. He, he bought them. He poured them out in our lives. You know, and and we could function in them, but it's sadly so many young ministers and older ministers too, younger and older generation, because we get so involved in the work, we get so involved in you know the giftings, we're flowing in that. We don't have time for rest. We're not serving. We're not you know uh, prioritizing family and things like that. We wind up in sin, or we wind up burnt out. And that's, man, that's, I do not want that to be a testimony for this generation, you know, like, yeah. that's why I love that you're emphasizing character along with the anointing. We need both. Yeah, I, I always, I've always told my friends and disciples and people that your gifts may draw people, but it's your character that will sustain people. And I think it was Dio Moody that said, if you take care of your character, your, your reputation would take care of itself. Yeah. And, you know, character is who you are. Your reputation is who people think you are. And with social media, you and I are millennials. Um, I get t- trapped with this. I get tempted with this. Yeah. Um, and we, we're looking for likes and followers and shares. But Jesus just wants us to serve him. And he just wants us to give our lives. Uh, Jesus, he, he dismissed the 5,000. He would rather have 12 true committed followers than 5,000 shallow followers. And I think more than ever, our generation and our culture is prone to create something, to force something, to make things burst in the flesh and not in the spirit. And I'll be honest with you, man, I'm wrestling with that all the time. I'm always praying, fasting and asking God to help help me have a pure heart, help me not to get trapped in the spirit of this age. And sometimes even things that look spiritual are actually fleshly. Even things that may look externally from the Lord 
are actually not from the Lord. And we see that all throughout scriptures. You know, we see that all throughout the scriptures of God actually rebuking fruit. An example would be God told Moses to hit the rock. I mean, I'm sorry, God told Moses to speak to the rock, but instead Moses hit the rock. But the crazy thing is water still came out because God's grace and God is still going to feed and bless the people. But in reality, Moses actually disobeyed God, but yet God still blessed him. And the Israelites still thought that God was using Moses, even though in that moment, Moses was disobeying God. And just because God is using somebody and just because God is blessing a ministry externally, no one really knows what's happening between them and God. And I'm and I'm worried about myself sometimes. Mm-hmm. I'm worried about this generation sometimes because anyone can make a ministry now. And another thing I was thinking was, as I was talking to you earlier, we see all these ministers um, and how much God is using them and their, but no one knows what they've been through. Like my father-in-law is my spiritual father and no one knows the suffering he's been through. No one, no one he's, 58 years old, the ministry is growing so much, but I've seen him suffer. I've seen him persevere. I've seen him serve. I've seen him have sleepless nights. And yeah. But God is now just blessing him. And I, and I see it's, it's a movement of the spirit and not just ambition. Yeah. Yeah. And that's really easy yeah. to get caught up in. That's super Absolutely. easy to get caught up in. And, um, you know, this is something that I've been realizing lately. And me and Selena have been looking at each other like, wow, you know, like we'll meet especially now being involved in different movements and stuff, we get to meet people, you know, that have a platform or whatever. And um, one thing we notice is like, there's people that, you know, are are recognized, well-known, but they talk, you know, and I'm not necessarily, you know, it's like, it's one of those things where it's like, they talk to you like you're the president, you know, they treat Mm -hmm. you like with so much love and so much honor and so much humility. And it's almost like this guy's got a massive platform or this person is being used by God tremendously, but you're just talking to him on the phone or you're just, you know, um, just have some kind of interaction with them. But the humility they carry, the character that shines from their lives, you know, like me and Selena have just been in awe. Like how does this person carry so much of the nature of Jesus Christ is because they've been through the ringer. Absolutely laid everything down they have suffered they've had they've had rewards time of reward and great you know abundance but they've also had lack and times of brokenness and persecution Absolutely. like the apostle paul i said i've learned to be content in all of these things because of his Absolutely. life and ministry and it's like i'm so glad the lord is bringing people like that um just you know these these people have a heart to father and to mentor or to, or to mother and to mentor and this younger generation we need that we need to see how they are off the stage we need to see how they are without a microphone um because i've met some people as well on the on the other side of the coin is you know they just you know ministry it becomes all about building a ministry and you could tell certain people are more self absorbed they they mm-hmm. kind of have their their head up and they're only talking about themselves and what god's doing through them and I've been in moments like that and I've thought to myself like, oh, like my spirit will be like, God, I love what you're doing in their life. I love the anointing. I love that they're touching thousands of people, but I want to guard my heart from that. Absolutely, man. I want I want my heart to remain pure. I want to guard my heart from, you know, always talking about myself, everything being about me, kind of carrying myself in that way. No matter how many people follow you on social media, no matter how big your platform is, I want my heart to be like these amazing men and women of God. Heidi Baker, Brian Simmons, these beautiful people I've been able to meet that literally carry Jesus and humility more than, you know, to such a great degree in depth. It's inspiring. No, absolutely, man. No, me too. But God and his grace has allowed me to meet some amazing men and women of God. And like you said, they all just been through stuff, bro. They, they've they been through the fire. They have enough scars to know that it's by the grace of God they are who they are. Like Apostle Paul says, it is by the grace of God I am who I am, you know, and there's no boasting. You know, they're not the wise man boast in his wisdom. They're not the rich, rich man boast in his wealth. Not, not the strong man boast in his strength, but let him who boast, boast that he knows the Lord. And I think we're losing that um, in our generation a lot, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And this yeah. is something that you even mentioned, you know, like nowadays, you know, it's like almost we want instant ministry success, you know, with social media and, and Facebook, you know, we could just, you know, we don't need to submit to a church, you know, anymore. You don't need to join some kind of apostolic network. You don't need to have accountability in your life. You could just start a Facebook page. You could just, yeah. you could just start an Instagram. You're just like a self-appointed prophet or, you know, and it's like, you know, I, I understand, you know, necessarily, you know, 
we, we can get into the structure of the system and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, it's just so easy to just kind of build a platform nowadays when, you know, and, and then we often we just see the highlight reel on people's Instagram pages. We have no clue what's going on in their lives. We have no clue what's going on behind the scenes, you know, and it's like, man, it's just it's so easy nowadays to do that instead of, like you said, serving eight years at a church somewhere serving, you know, um, an itinerant minister who's now your father-in-law, but pouring in and serving. God has literally highlighted times in my life where he said, you are who you are today because you served that woman for three and a half years and you gave everything to her. You know, Christ for the nations. I served this woman, Sharon Hobbs, and the Lord specifically spoke to me. You are who you are. You, you carry yourself today and the gift things in your life today are because you laid down your life to serve her. And my pastor in New Jersey, we've served him, honored him. And all these different people, but it's like, man, this is something that's missing. I feel like we don't speak about it that yeah, much today in ministry. No, I mean, as, as you're speaking, I'm thinking about the. I've been thinking about this concept of giving birth to a ministry yeah. versus manufacturing a ministry. And what I mean by that is, when you give birth to a ministry, it's the Lord that plants a seed into your spirit. When you manufacture a ministry, it's like a Tower of Babel. Right, you're building your own name. Right? Genesis 11, Tower of Babel, it says, "Let us build a tower and make our names great, and let us not be dispersed." Which is right after that is Genesis 12. Very similar phrases. God tells Abram, "I will make your name great." It's wow. not Abram, you make your name great. I <laughs> will make your name great. Hmm. And Abram, different from the the people in Tower of Babel, the the Babel, the people in the Tower of Babel wanted to stay in comfort and leisure and promote themselves. But Abraham wanted to leave because God says, go and leave. And what I see is a lot of a lot of us, a lot of people, especially this age, when I go on the mission field in the mountains of Southeast Asia among unreached people groups, they don't care about what we care about. They won't even be talking about this. They don't even care about no Instagram or Facebook. They care about the lost. They care about souls. They care about church planting. Mm -hmm. They care about discipleship. They care about the hungry and the poor and the broken and the sick. Mm -hmm. They won't even be talking about this because they're actually obeying the scriptures. Mm -hmm. But a lot of us um, in, in our in our culture and generation, we're manufacturing things. We're forcing things. And I think uh, one of my heroes, I think it was Francis Chan, he said, one of the most dangerous things is actually to succeed at what God never told you to do. True. A lot of people think, you know, danger is failing at what God told you to do. But in reality, succeeding at what God never told you to do is more dangerous because you'd be deceived. James 1, right? Do not be deceived, my brothers. Christians can be deceived. We could be bewitched. He says, who has bewitched you? Galatians, right? So yeah. I think, and this is what I think about the difference. Why people manufacture compared to giving birth. When you manufacture a ministry, it's right here, right now. You can do it. But when you give birth, there's nine months of pregnancy, right? There is a waiting season. There is a period where you have to wait on the Lord. Um, this is what I like to say. There's a difference between knowing God's will, knowing God's timing, and knowing God's ways. A lot of people, they actually heard from the Lord. Many of you guys who are here listening and tuned in, you have a promise from God. You have a vision from God. But Joseph had a vision, but it took 17 years for that dream and vision to come true. David was anointed king, 1 Samuel 16. But scholars say it wasn't until 15 to 20 years later that he became king, right? So what that means is God's will for David was to be king. But God's timing was 15 to 20 years later because he wanted David to be God's king, not man's king. Saul was man's king, a manufactured king, a forced king. A king that was made because men wanted to be like other nations. They wanted to build a nation like the people around them. But God's king is different. A man after God's own heart had to have 15 to 20 years of pain, suffering, persecution. Like you said, submission. He had to submit to Saul, honor Saul. When Saul tried to kill him, David says, I would not touch the Lord's anointed. Because David knew that. There is no slow cooker. There is no microwave. There is no Yelp. There is no fast food in God's kingdom, right? Mm -hmm. It takes time. You have to get the vision. That The vision has to become a part of who you are. And in God's timing, this is what I learned about God's ministry. 
he releases you. It just flows, bro. I, I've learned. Uh, I know we're young, and I'm not saying I know. What I, I've experienced glimpses of this, but when God's in it, it just happens. Yeah, it just flows. You you don't need to you don't need to promote. You don't need to uh, play games. You don't need to try to make anything happen. God breathes, and once He breathes, it's over. <laughs> And, and I've learned throughout the years um, from watching those who've gone before us, but even glimpses in my own life, God's will, God's timing, and God's way are, are three different things. And a lot of times we jump to God's timing and God's ways way before it's actually what he wants for us. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely true, bro. Absolutely true. And there is like, <clears throat> it's just, I feel like we've, gotten really good nowadays just in the flesh just humanity we've gotten really good at taking things that should be a process and just <laughs> making them instantaneous you know yeah, how, absolutely. How, how could our wi-fi be faster how could our food be faster how could we you know make things the most convenient how could we make lives you know more comfortable and if you read the bible that's just not the journey of all these great men and women of god you know it took time to persevere in these promises and um yeah man it's just it's just a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing because God, you know, he's more concerned with the inward work of the heart than he is with the yeah. outward work of your hands. So Absolutely. In, in the waiting, he's doing a work in your heart. He's breaking off the pride. He's breaking off the, the um, self-dependency. He's breaking off, you know, all these different things. And he's literally refining us. He's an all-consuming fire. And he's literally refining us. And we're coming out like gold. And he's literally making our hearts so strong, steadfast, fortified, so that we'll be able to carry the blessings that he so longs to pour out in our lives. You know, he doesn't want, you know, he doesn't delight in the pain, he doesn't delight in the sorrow. He actually, he hurts with us. He's sorrowful with us. You know, he told us to rejoice with those who rejoice, but he also told us to weep with those who weep. And he weeps with us when we are weeping. He cries, he hurts with us. But at the same time, he sees deeper than what's just happening externally. He sees this precious work that he's doing in our hearts and he sees down the line he sees what you're walking into and oftentimes we're just blind to that and we only see the present but um he does a work just like the israelites in the wilderness man he was doing a work in their hearts he didn't want to just give them a land flowing with milk and honey he wanted to show them who he is he wanted to reveal to them he wanted to teach them how not to grumble and complain and just to worship him in the wilderness before they actually had to go in and fight the big giant so i agree so much yeah. I, I just finished a book um, by an author named Dr. Robert Clinton. One of my favorite books is called The Making of a Leader. And this is what he says. He says, before the Lord works through you, he has to first work in you. Yeah. And it's that in-between. It's that wilderness. Why did they have to go through a wilderness? Because they weren't ready for the promised land. Right. If they were to go to their promised land, they would have been spoiled. They would have lost all the blessings because they had too much. They had 400 years of slavery in them, though they were... They were set free from slavery externally. Mm -hmm. They still had slavery within them. Yes. So during those 40 years, God was purifying and sanctifying and redeeming. And you know, man, I'll be real with you, dude. I have so many ambitions. Um, mm -hmm. they're, they're both godly and sinful. Mm -hmm. And I thank God for the things he hasn't done in my life as much as now mm -hmm. I thank God for what he did. Because mm -hmm. if he would have answered all my selfish, sinful prayers, I would not... I wouldn't understand the humility of Christ, the Philippian two, mm -hmm. Philippians two type of humility. I wouldn't understand the character of Christ that Paul talks about in Galatians five. And I think as ministers and pastors and young leaders, it's so important that we understand that God is working in you. Again, with with Joseph, he had a dream. He tells his brothers, I had a dream that y'all bowing down to me. I had a dream that dad's going to bow down to me. And that was God's will because he's going to be prime minister. In Genesis, I think it was 50. They actually come and bow down. Yeah. But it took 17 years of slavery and prison. Because this is, I forget who said this, but someone said the bigger the calling, the longer the desert. Mm. The bigger the calling on your life, the, the deeper the suffering. I think A.W. Tozer said, um, before God uses someone greatly, he must first wound them deeply. And I think if, when I read the scriptures and I study the lives of biographies of men and women of God that God used, there was so much brokenness that had to happen beforehand. Yeah. They had to struggle with not paying rent. They had to struggle with sickness. They had to struggle with that before. 
so that when the blessings come and the doors open, that their character will sustain them, man. Absolutely. I agree with you. And this is something that's very close to home to both of us, you know, and in one way, shape or form, we're, we're in that place. Me and you, 28 years old, 30 years old, God's put dreams in our hearts mm-hmm. and we're trusting him and we're walking them out by faith. And sometimes you have no clue where it's going to come in, how it's going to happen. But, you know, people always say that the wilderness is a place where like miracles are absent. You know, so many people think I'm in a wilderness. What's happening in my life? But for me, the wilderness is a place where miracles are born. Mm. You know, in that wilderness place, you 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 see the heart of your father. He's, he's, he's providing supernatural manna. He's leading you with a cloud by day and a fire by night. He's protecting you from your enemies. He's opening up the sea and swallowing all of your enemies. But at the same time, day by day, you're not seeing where you're going, how it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, you're seeing the miraculous hand of God. You're seeing his provision. And he's taking that slave mentality that all of us have or that orphan mentality that all of us have. And he's trying to show us who he is as our father to protect provide, care for us, lead us. He's trying to bring this revelation to us. He's a father, you know, over our lives, brooding over us, wanting to be in a heart to heart, intimate connection with him. And he is, he's breaking off that slave mentality, that orphan mentality. And he's showing us, you're a son. I saved you. I took you out of Egypt. I'm bringing you through the wilderness into a land that I have ordained for you, a land flowing with milk and honey. And me and you, we know it. Ministers of old know it. I am so encouraged by lives. I'm so glad that I've, you know, heard so many stories like you. I've read God's generals and I've, I've heard John Bevere's story and all these different people, you know, we judge our now based on someone else's 30 years, you know, of, of ministry. <laughs> you know, a lot of times we see like a Todd yeah. White or a John Bevere or a, you know, or a Bill Johnson and we say, oh, well, oh man, I want to be just like that. It took them years to get to that place of kingdom effectiveness and ministry and all the things that they're doing. But um, something that you mentioned to me earlier, and I'd really love to touch on this, is the um, idea of Abraham and Ishmael. Okay, can you talk about that a little bit? Well, yeah, I was just talking to a friend, actually, last week. We're just hanging out, and we're talking about s- similar topics. We're talking about trying to follow the Spirit's leading and obedient to God's Word over our ambitions and desires. And my friend mentioned to me, he said, if you look at Genesis 22, God actually tells Abraham, take your son your only son, Isaac, which is so weird because Abraham actually had two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. But what that means is that God only sees what he promised and what he blesses. And in other words, right, as we all know, I forget the exact verse, Genesis probably 16, where Ishmael was born, right? Ishmael was born, but God told Isaac, I'm going to give you a son through Sarah, through Sarai. I'm going to give you a son through her, but not through Hagar, but Abraham takes this promise and forces it. He takes this promise and uses his flesh and he he forces the hand of God. And Ishmael is born, but God wanted Isaac to be the firstborn. God wanted Isaac to be the chosen child. And what that means is it's a mixture of both. Even though it was God's will for Abraham to have a child, it wasn't his will for Abraham to force it. God wanted to teach Abraham patience. God wanted to teach Abraham to trust in his promises when things seemed impossible. But because he forced it, all this drama went through, as you know, all the drama historically in the Middle East, even to this day. But it's so weird that when God tells Abraham to sacrifice his only son. So again, the whole idea is you can actually do things that God never told you to do. (laughs) You can actually succeed at things that people may think God is in, but it's not. And that's the one thing that we look at Abram, right? In the beginning, he was supposed to leave his home, his kindred, his town, but he took Lot with him. So the very next verse and the very next chapter, the first thing God had to do was separate him from Lot because he wanted to teach Abram to depend on God completely. And later, again, he wanted to teach Abram to believe upon his word that you will have a son. It's going to be a miraculous son. It's a shadow of the miraculous son of Christ, right? But again... He took it into his own hands. And even people who are, I don't know if anyone's, I don't know who you are listening to this. Even in your life, don't be discouraged if things aren't happening. There's a promise in your life. There's a word in your life. There's a conviction in your life. And God has spoken to you through your times of prayer, through your times in the word. And you're so discouraged that it's not happening. And you may be tempted to force it. You may be tempted to make it happen. You may be tempted to promote yourself. No, no. When God's timing comes, you don't need to do any of that. He's going to breathe on you. 
He's going to yeah. send people around you. The doors are going to open for you. The finances, all these things, right? It's just, it's crazy when God does it, man. Like when God breathes, all you got to do is just position the sails to receive it. But a lot of people try to force the waves. And that's why you're so tired. Because when you try to force the waves, you get exhausted. You get burnt out. You get frustrated. But when you just set the sails and say, Lord, you breathe as you desire. Not my will, your will be done, right? And here's another thing. I've learned that God doesn't hear all prayers. God answers certain type of prayers that move his heart. Let me give you an example. When Moses said, show me your glory, God said, that's a prayer that I will bless. When um, Solomon said, give me wisdom, God said, that's a prayer that I will bless. When Jacob said, I won't let you go until you bless me, that's a prayer that I will bless. And a lot of us, what God actually wants you to pray is a prayer of surrender and say, Lord, whatever you want, whatever you desire, my, not my will, your will, not my relationships, your relationships, not my dreams, your dreams. And I'm learning more and more. Um, that's harder to find, man. I've been meeting a lot of people our age, your age, older, younger, and they're quote unquote successful. But when I spend time with them, my heart is sometimes grieved. Because there's no reverence, there's no holiness, there's no prayer, there's no intimacy, there's no suffering, there's no depth, right? I've been thinking about this concept. Everybody wants to go higher, but nobody wants to go deeper, right? Mm -hmm. But if you go deep, God would take care of your breath. God would take care of your height. I forget, my friend once told me one of the first things that an engineer and an architect ask a businessman that wants to build a building, the first thing they ask is, how high do you want this building to be? Mm. Because the higher they build it, the deeper they have to dig. Yeah. And a lot of us are trying to go higher before we're going deeper. No, mm. go deep into prayer. Go deep into fasting. Go deep into his word. Go deep into serving at church. Go deep. And as, as long as you are digging deep, God will take care of everything else. But if you're trying to go high, you're on shallow grounds, man. You're the thorny soil. You're the rocky soil. You're not the good soil that's going to produce good fruit, lasting fruit. And you and I have seen it, right? We've read it. We've met people, men and women of God who've succeeded so fast. Revival broke out globally, but yeah. they fell overnight. And it's because I think many of them, I mean, there's many factors to it. But one of the major factors is that their roots did not go deep. They did not have depth. They did not have the character that we're talking about. And I'm scared to death because some of these men and women of God are people that I have looked up to. And I still honor, I still respect, I still give blessings because God has used them. But I don't want to be that man. <laughs> I don't want to be that man that, quote unquote, was used by God. And at the end of my life, look at Billy Graham. Come on now. We're celebrating his life. Because he had a fulfilled life. He he reached the charismatics, the conservatives, the reforms, the Catholics, the Pentecostals, because he preached Christ crucified and he lived a life of integrity wherever he was, right? I don't know if you know the Manifesto Modesto. He committed to financial purity, sexual purity, and he also said he would never talk bad about another minister. And he committed, I think he was with John Stott and some other leaders, and he would say, hey, Let's live a life of sexual purity. Let's live a life of financial purity. Let's never bad mouth any other minister. Because at that time, he was blowing up. But he said people were persecuting him. People were saying that he shouldn't be doing this. He shouldn't be doing that. He shouldn't be spending time with politicians, with celebrities, with charismatics and conservatives. He said, hey, you could bad mouth me all you want, but I won't bad mouth other people. Because Billy Graham was a man of integrity. I was watching his funeral, bro, and I started crying. I was literally in my prayer closet in my room, and I just tuned in as I was praying because it just came up. Yeah. My friend messaged me. His funeral was going live. I started weeping, dude. I started weeping when these different ministers came up and talked about how he was exactly the same yeah. when he was at home, when he was with janitors and when he was with celebrities when he was with new converts and mega church leaders and presidents nothing fazed him because he was a servant of the lord and i pray i was crying and i said lord 
please make me like that and make this generation like that. Absolutely. And this is something that's really on my heart to share with the people who are watching right now, based on like everything you're saying. I talk about Billy Graham. Okay. He just recently went on to his reward. He's in glory with Jesus. He ran his race. He has his crown of righteousness. He served well, but this is really close to me. I didn't know Billy Graham personally. Okay. But my pastor, David T. Demola, and I want to honor him right now. My pastor, David T. Demola in New Jersey, he is a man of the nations. He was an apostle, 74 years old. He died like six days after um, Billy Graham passed. So he passed on to his reward and glory. He has impacted the nations. He's impacted New Jersey, all over the U.S. And this is really near to me because he wasn't just my pastor. He was like a spiritual dad. He believed in me. He, he, he uh, opened up doors of opportunity for me. He blessed my ministry. I, I served him, whatever I can do, different capacities at the church, you know, outside of the church. He was just there and he was such a mighty man of God. And the church is now transitioning and, and still doing well and God's still there. The presence of the Lord is still there right. and they're moving forward right. with momentum. But I just want to say that, man, these, these great men of God are passing on to their reward. They're going to glory. And it's like, now it's our time. It's our That's time. And we are exactly. right. We're rising up, but a piece of Billy Graham is left behind and all the people that he imparted to the um, the heart and the mantle of Pastor David Tinamola is left behind in the heart of all those that he sowed into, all those he laid hands on, all those he taught and ministered to. And now the Lord's saying, you know, the, the, these mantles and these impartations are on the younger generation, some of the older generation that's still around that are pioneering and still serving and still going out there. But it's like it's our time to arise and shine. And I just say this to those who are watching right now. If you're a young man or woman of God, find a leader that is operating in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Find a leader with integrity or um, find a leader that knows the word of God or that is flowing and functioning in some area of ministry that you feel highly called to and serve them. Lay your life down for them. Uh, you know, you, we, we want people to serve our callings and, and our vision one day. Well, invest your life into someone else's vision right now. You know, I, I, I'm forever changed and forever revolutionized by Pastor David Tidamola and Sharon Hobbs from Christ for the Nations and, and uh, Dr. Brian Simmons in the Passion Translation. And I went out of my way to serve them like you've served. And this is, this is key. If you want to be a leader, you need to be a servant with the towel in your hands. Okay. Absolutely. What? If you want a prophet's reward, you have to serve and honor the prophet, okay? You can't just grab a prophet's reward. It doesn't come that way. You can't just have them lay hands on you all the time and receive the reward, okay? You need to honor the prophet, serve the prophet, and you'll receive a piece of who they are. They've suffered to receive what they've received. They've been through stuff to receive what they've received. So anyway, man, I just feel this strongly on my heart right now. There's people that are watching, and I'm telling you, you have a dream, you have a vision, serve someone else's dream, serve someone else's vision, Lay your life down. Don't, don't, there's, there's no fast food Christianity. Read the Bible, okay? So let the Lord work in your heart so we can pour out the blessings, the anointing, and the gifts through your hands, through your mouth, through your heart. You know, so let him work in you so he can work through you, just like Will Chung was saying earlier on the show. So I feel the anointing, man. I feel the presence of God. And this is, this is how I, I, I really feel led to like sum up this interview. If you have something in your heart to pray and minister, please do that. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come up behind you and, and we'll pray for, for the people who are watching. Yeah, you know what, man? I'm just going to um, I'm just going to build off what you just said. Um, I was, as you were sharing this, I was thinking about Elijah to Elisha. Yeah. Elisha was young like us. He was bold. He was passionate. And he goes to Elijah and says, I want your anointing. Give me a double portion. And Elijah doesn't give it to him. Elijah says, follow me. Follow me. As long as you're there when I'm caught up, you will receive the impartation. Why? The anointing is caught. It is not taught. The yeah. things of God are caught. They are not taught. You don't learn ministry in a classroom. You don't learn a ministry from studying. You learn it by being around men of women of God. And I was even thinking about all these people. Joshua it says in the book of Exodus that when Moses would go into the tent, Joshua will be right outside. And when Moses came out, Joshua will go in. Joshua received an anointing. He received an impartation by being around them. My father-in-law mentored me by telling me to follow him. He had me preach at rehab centers. He had me preach at jails. He had me preach at churches. He had me testify in the mountains of Oaxaca and Nueva Vizcaya in the Philippines. And it was as I honored him, served him, 
that I receive so much. So as you're saying, man, I just want to encourage any of you guys who are zealous and passionate. You have convictions and dreams. Just be faithful. How do you be faithful? Be faithful to your present circumstances and your present environment. Give your all to your local church. Serve the leaders that God has placed above you. The Bible says submit to your leaders. I think it's Hebrews 13, 5. I'm not sure. Submit to your leaders for they are shepherding your souls. And as David submitted to Saul and honored Saul. So I just want to encourage you guys to do that, man. Honor and submit to your church leaders, the pastors and leaders God has placed above you. Be faithful to your current situations and just surrender to the will of God. And I'm excited to see how God is going to move in our generation, bro. New season, God's doing new things, and God is looking for God is looking for us to just take the man. I don't know what else to say, but God is the the world is groaning for the sons of God to be revealed. And in this hour and this time, God is asking us as young leaders to be faithful and to give our all, bro. Yeah. yeah man. So, dude, thank you so much, bro. I just got a text message from my wife. There's actually something urgent she needs me for. Yeah, just, no, no dude, problem. In Jesus' name, we just bless everyone who's watching. We just thank you, Lord, for ministering to their hearts right now. And just, Will, thank you so much for joining me on the broadcast, man. I really appreciate you, bro. Bless you, man. I look forward to connecting more. Yeah, man. We'll hang out soon, bro. All right. God bless you. All right, man. Peace. For everyone who's watching, I'm so sorry. I got to get to this. Bless you guys. Love you. Later.